This is Dr. Mimi Lam from Metro Health Medical Center at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. I would like to share with you a case of hyponatremia that I encountered, which turned out to be a little complicated, very interesting, and provided a great opportunity to go through the entire differential diagnosis of hyponatremia. The internist who referred this patient to me wrote, This is a 52-year-old, very lean male who has had hyponatremia for a long time. His sodium is now lower than usual at 128. I have recently started him on lisinopril for hypertension, and I'm not sure if this could be contributing to an even lower sodium. I'm not sure if this low sodium and his leanness and his high blood pressure could be part of one problem. Please assist with further evaluation and treatment. So this was a 52-year-old white male referred for asymptomatic hyponatremia. His serum sodium had persistently been 128 to 134 for the past two years. Serum creatinine had been 0.43 to 0.70, BUN less than or equal to 3. Past history was significant for hypertension, and he was on lisinopril for the past three months. He had had an episode of candida esophagitis a year prior with HIV antibodies negative. He had had polio at age 8 with no residual deficit. Current meds were lisinopril 20 mg daily, Nexium 40, and albuterol as needed for wheezing. He described his typical diet as being a McDonald's McGriddle breakfast in the morning, a normal lunch, and junk such as a burger for dinner. His typical fluid intake was 2 cups of coffee, 32 ounces of Gatorade, and a 12 ounce beer daily. He smoked a pack per day, drank one beer a day, and as far as drugs, had not used any for 25 years, but had used virtually everything in the early 80s, although nothing IV. He lived with his wife and two cats, and worked as a criminal investigator for Cuyahoga County at the Justice Center downtown. Family history was positive for CVA, breast cancer, cardiac disease, and negative for diabetes and hypertension. On physical exam, he was afebrile with heart rate 90 Blood pressures 129 over 82 and 116 over 70. His weight was 58.4 kilos and BMI was 19. He was a thin white male in no acute distress with moist mucous membranes and normal skin turgor. His exam was remarkable only for wrinkled skin and diffusely decreased breath sounds consistent with his smoking history, and he had no edema. A recently obtained chest X-ray had changes consistent with COPD and no mass or infiltrate. In analyzing cases of hyponatremia, we typically start down the differential based on our history and physical exam, even before seeing any labs, since lab results usually take at least several hours, if not days, to come back. I usually find it easiest to approach a case like this, as we do with most types of differential diagnosis, by considering the broad mechanisms by which the problem can develop, and then eliminating the ones that don't seem to apply. Clinically, it makes sense to think of hyponatremia as being a problem with the normal response to water intake. Normally, after taking in a water load, we decrease our plasma osmolality, which causes ADH secretion to be suppressed and results in decreased renal collecting duct water reabsorption, production of lots of dilute urine, and a return of piasm back to normal. So hyponatremia actually represents an impaired ability to excrete water, and this is often mediated by an increase in ADH, or at least a failure to suppress it when needed. Clinically, it's useful to think of the causes of hyponatremia in the broad categories of volume depletion, volume expansion, and normal ECF volume. With volume depletion, hyponatremia occurs because the significantly low intravascular volume stimulates ADH secretion, and causes renal water reabsorption in order to preserve remaining ECF volume even when water retention results in hyponatremia. This patient did not seem volume depleted on physical exam, and he did not give a history of abnormal volume losses, such as from decreased intake, vomiting, diarrhea, diuretic use, etc. Volume expansion can also result in hyponatremia because of decreased effective circulating volume, such as is encountered in heart failure with low cardiac output, ADH secretion continues in response to baroreceptor signals such that water cannot be excreted appropriately even when it needs to be, resulting in hyponatremia. Our patient did not appear at all volume expanded. 
He gave no history of heart failure, did not have distended neck veins or crackles in his lungs, his cardiac exam was normal, and he did not have abdominal distension or edema. That left us with the category that is hardest to analyze and diagnose, the euvolemic category. Euvolemic hyponatremia can develop by a variety of mechanisms. The one that immediately comes to mind is the syndrome of inappropriate ADH, or SIADH, in which something like a tumor, a cerebral or pulmonary disorder, or a medication results in secretion of ADH that is unresponsive to the usual suppressive mechanisms. In this case, although we worried about a lung tumor because of his smoking history, he had no abnormality on chest X-ray, no signs or symptoms of any cerebral disorder that might account for SIADH, and no history of taking any of the meds associated with SIADH, such as sulfonylureas, carbamazepine, psychotropics, or antidepressants. And so, having seemingly excluded the more common mechanisms of hyponatremia, we now needed to think about the more unusual ones. For instance, could this be pseudo-hyponatremia in which plasma water is displaced by large bulky molecules such as lipids or abnormal proteins? Normally, plasma is 93% water with a sodium concentration of 154 milliequivalents per liter in that water and about 7% bulky stuff like lipids and proteins, giving a measured serum sodium concentration of 140 to 145 milliequivalents per liter of plasma. When large amounts of proteins or lipids displace more water, the measured sodium concentration per volume of plasma becomes low. But our patient had no hyperlipidemia, exhibited no signs or symptoms of multiple myeloma, and his globulin gap on his liver function tests, the difference between total protein and albumin, was not elevated to suggest the presence of an abnormal paraprotein. And so now we were left to consider causes of hyponatremia where everything in the neurohormonal system and the kidneys works normally, but the amount of water that the patient takes in cannot be excreted for some reason. Normally, we filter about 150 liters per day through the glomeruli. We absorb about two-thirds of that proximally, leaving 50 liters per day, and we absorb another 15 to 20 percent in the loop of Henle and distal tubule, leaving about 24 liters per day to either be reabsorbed or not, depending on how much ADH is around. So if ADH is completely suppressed, we can excrete an average of about one liter of water per hour. This is a lot. We rarely see hyponatremia occurring because the patient drinks more water than the normal kidney can excrete. One condition in which this does occur is so-called psychogenic polydipsia, in which patients feel a compulsion to drink water, often because of psychiatric illness or sometimes because of the dry mouth that psychotropic drugs induce. It has occasionally been reported in victims of fraternity hazing who are forced to drink large quantities of water, more than a liter per hour, or in marathon runners who intend to prevent dehydration by tanking up on water before a race. I obtained no suggestion of any of these mechanisms with our patient, so I moved on to a consideration of beer potomania, in which a person is unable to excrete water because of inadequate solute excretion to accompany it. Since urine osmolality can be decreased only as low as 50 milliasms per kilo, some solute excretion is needed to accompany water. And rarely patients who obtain all of their calories and water intake in the form of beer unaccompanied by salt or protein may develop hyponatremia via this unusual mechanism. Again, our patient's history did not seem compatible with this disorder since his beer consumption was reported as 12 ounces per day and his McDonald's meals would have contained plenty of both salt and protein to allow water excretion at a uosm of 50. Since his history and physical exams seemed inconsistent with every cause of hyponatremia, I was stymied. So now a look at his labs was helpful. His kidney function was normal, his liver function was normal, and urine studies were very interesting. As we talked about, the basic cause of hyponatremia is an impaired ability to get rid of excess water. While multiple mechanisms actually contribute to this water excreting problem, the three categories of hyponatremia, hypovolemic, euvolemic, and hypervolemic, all have in common, as we've discussed, an inability to suppress ADH secretion. So with unwanted ADH around, one would expect renal water reabsorption to be occurring, 
causing an elevated urine-specific gravity and osmolality, whereas this patient had a urine spec grav of less than 1005 and a urine osmolality of 86, suggesting that his normal water-excreting mechanisms were actually intact and that he was normally suppressing ADH in response to hyponatremia, a finding that would not be expected with volume depletion, expanded ECF volume, or SIADH. Based on these lab results, which came back after the patient had gone home, I wrote to his PCP and suggested that she ask him again about his diet and alcohol consumption. She did so and replied that he denied taking any over-the-counter meds or supplements, but that he did drink an occasional beer, sometimes with lunch or dinner. He denied illegal drug use, but again admitted that in the 80s he had tried almost everything but no IV drugs, such as heroin and no crack cocaine. Interestingly, he also had a high serum osmolality, normal is 275 to 295, although you would have expected it to be low since the serum sodium was low. So the next time I saw the patient, attempting to hone in on his alcohol consumption, I ordered a serum osmolality and compared the measured osmolality with his calculated serum osm, which is based on the estimate two times the sum of the sodium plus potassium concentrations in milliequivalents per liter, plus the serum glucose divided by 18, plus BUN divided by 2.8. While the measured serum osm was 305, the calculated was only 266, revealing an osmolar gap of 39 that suggested the presence of an unmeasured osmotically active substance such as an alcohol like ethanol or isopropyl alcohol. Again, when results were available, I informed his PCP, who again failed to elicit any history of unusual alcohol ingestion from the patient. However, she did check his blood alcohol level and toxicology screens on that visit and found a blood alcohol level of 201 with urine and blood tox screens being negative except for ethanol. The patient admitted to having had a beer for lunch that day, and there things stalled until several months later when his PCP wrote to me to say, Mr. C. came to see me today to ask for assistance to stop drinking. He says he started out drinking occasionally and finds himself unable to stop now, thinks he needs help. He has been drinking 6 to 12 or more beers per day. He often does not eat because he feels so bloated from all the beer. I gave him a list of possible options for rehab. He has told his supervisor and his wife that he needs help. Thanks for your assistance. He thanks you too. So in summary, this was an unusual case of beer potomania with ingestion of large quantities of beer, lots of liquid, and little or no solute containing food, limiting the amount of water that could be excreted at the minimum required uosm of 50. This case provides us with the opportunity to consider all of the possible mechanisms of hyponatremia and reminds us that we can often make or at least suspect the diagnosis from history and physical alone. Here, even though the history was not classic for beer potomania, it was the history and physical with his past drug use, his leanness and low BMI that led us to keep asking about his alcohol intake. Later, when lab results returned, the very low BUN of less than 3 the discrepancy between that and the diet history that he gave, and the serum osmolal gap gave us further reason to pursue alcohol as a cause. And so this case reminds us that clinical medicine can be messy because it includes social and human considerations that are not so obvious when we read textbook descriptions of how things are supposed to be in various disorders.